Right, hello everybody, welcome to the fourth Tango Kernel webinar. This one is focused on PyTango. Some of the previous ones have looked at CPP Tango and Pogo. So the idea here is to give you an overview of of the internals of PyTango and the repository and hopefully give you some guidelines that will help you to contribute to the project. My name is Anton Joubert from the National Research Foundation, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. I'm based in Cape Town. My co-host is Jeff Ment from STFC. Um, Jeff, you want to say anything? Good morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'm one of the maintainers on the PyTango project. Jeff's also been working on it for a long time. Um, some of you probably have been with PyTango even longer than, than us, so you please correct us if we go wrong. On the agenda, you would have seen an invitation, but to be a brief introduction, we'll look at how the repository fits together. Some of the dependencies that you need if you're going to use PyTango, um, how to set up a development environment, run the test, add a new test, so the kinds of things you would do if, if you wanted to contribute to the project. Uh, we'll look briefly at the architecture, sort of how the extension module works, and then we'll probably spend the most time on the practical examples. So then I'm going to step through the code, show you what happens when we read an attribute. After that, just a few tips that might make it a little bit easier um, when you're developing or reporting issues. A brief overview of our, how, how the contribution workflow uh, is expected to happen, and then a few questions right at the end. Um, as I'm talking, you're welcome to put questions in the, in the chat, um, but I'll only answer them right at the end. All right, so what is PyTango? A lot of you would have seen this diagram before. Um, let's just focus on that. So you've got a Python application and you want to either talk to a Tango device or you want to write a Tango device and you like Python. So you will use the PyTango library. So it's a layer that sits between your application and CPP Tango. Uh, it's got a low level API and a high level API, which we will look at a bit later. And then the thing we call the binding. So this is C++ code and it's the interface or the glue between the Python code and the C++ library. And obviously C++ Tango depends on things like Omni, Orb and Zero MQ for the transport. And those depend on your operating system kernel. So yeah, it's a Tango library. Um, it uses Boost Python for the binding, and we'll get to PyBind 11 at some stage, that's what Jeff is working on. Um, a while ago, Ren Reynolds said he thought we were using the Omni or Python library, and just wanted to point out that we were not using the Python implementation of Omni or we're just using it via CPP Tango. Use NumPy and does run on Linux and Windows. On Mac OS, um, recently, I think Thomas Jurgen managed to get it to work on Mac OS as well. Um, but that's only on the 9.4 branch of CPP Tango. The 9.3 branch of CPP Tango won't compile on Mac OS out the box. Um, I'm working on Mac OS and just using Docker containers for the development. And then from Python 2.7 up to probably the latest. And we are going to keep supporting Python 2.7 for quite a while still because a lot of, of you are still using Python 2.7 at your institutes. But we would really like to phase it out at this end of life. Uh, I found some slides on the history of PyTango. So it seems to have started sometime before 2003. The first mention I could find was in an Eclipse paper. 
in 2003 um, started Salalin, if anyone else knows better. Um, let's move to Alba then. So Tugal was working on the server. Tiago Coutinho was the main contributor for a long time. Got to pipe.org in 2010. And the high level server API was added. Moved with Tiago to SRF. Became an official Debian package 2016, version 9, 2016. Uh, Vincent Michel became a maintainer at that stage. Solaris joined. Um, okay, let's start about Max4 joining at some stage. <laughs> I don't know where that went, sorry. Uh, SKA joined as well in 2018. I started around 2019. And more recently, uh, it's available via Conda. It was on our custom channel called Tango Controls, but um, Benjamin has put it on Conda Forward, which is a more mainstream um, channel for Conda packages. If I didn't mention your name um, or your institute, I'm sorry, I didn't really know how to get that information from everyone, but. I'm glad you're using PyTango. Next up, um, so the original goal, as far as I can tell, was just to be a wrapper around the C++ Tango library. So that gave us the low level Python API and your Python code would look very much like the C code, C++ code. So that was a good start. Um, later, there was this idea to make it more Pythonic and I think that's been a big improvement. So that gives us the high level API, which if you're coming from a Python background, it's a lot easier and more intuitive to use. Now, looking at the repository, I've just got a tree of all the directories. In the root, we have things like set up the Pi, the CI YAML files, licenses, all the standard stuff you would get. Then, the next folder is .dev container. So inside here, you'll find um, things to help you build a Docker container specifically for developers, configure your editor. Um, this nanny convention comes from Visual Studio Code. The CMake folder, there's some utilities and these are only used for the Windows compilation actually. Then all the Sphinx docs are in their own folder. There's an interesting one called TEP, which is um, kind of like a, Py, a PyTango extension proposal, like Python pips. And there's only two of them, but they are interesting to read. One of them explains the, the high level API and the thoughts behind it. An examples folder, there's various obviously examples, and that's a good place to start sometimes. I haven't shown all of them here. I often just use the clock one to, to test simple things. Then in the ext folder, that's where the C++ code lives. ext for extension. In this folder, you also see the common utilities and things for working with the client. So the device proxy, for example, lives in that folder. And then there's another one for server where we've got the device, device server. Then the Tango um, folder, that's the, the Python code, right? So you, which you'd import as Tango. Everything is in there. This folder used to be called PyTango. A um, few years ago, there was a decision to rename it. So you'll see old code often imports as PyTango instead of just Tango. And for the time being, it's still compatible. Then there's a database DS folder, which has got a, a Python based implementation of database DS server, but that's not maintained. Um, I think there's even a fork in another repository. So I'm not really sure what the latest version of this is. Um, if someone online can comment on that, maybe in, a, in the chat would be good. And then finally we have the unit tests and the test files. So pretty standard setup. The 
dependencies that we have. Uh, we depend on libtango, which is the C++ Tango library, at least version 9.3, and all of its dependencies like OmniWalk and 0MQ. And we need Boost Python, obviously, for the extension. Python dependencies include NumPy and 6. And then you, you can build PyTango Py without NumPy, uh, but I don't think anyone is still using it that way. And once we get into the, the PyBind 11 work, we will definitely require NumPy. Then some setup dependencies. And then for the green modes, there's some optional packages. So if you want to use the futures green mode or the G-Event green mode, then you install those packages. If you're not going to use those features, you don't need to install them. And how do you set up a development environment? So you start by cloning the code, either the main repository, or you can fork it and, and clone that fork. So that's your typical command to do it. Then I would go into the dev container folder. There's a detailed readme in there, but once you're in that folder, you can then build the Docker image that you want to work with. And there's a few options on which version of Python you use. You have 2.7, 3.7, or 3.8. And then there's a few options of Tango version. Um, 9.25 is still there, 9.32 and 9.34. These are to help when we want to look at regressions or you know, things that used to work and are broken. Maybe we want to test against different, different versions. So you do a Docker build. Um, these environment variables are, are passed into the Docker file. And then it, it installs the correct environment. It would be nice to have these things built automatically by CI. So you could just pull it. Um, we haven't got to that stage. If anyone wants to do that, go ahead. We could probably host them on GitLab um, now that we've, we've moved from GitHub to GitLab. Once you've built that container, then you can run it. And I typically will use a volume mount. So I have the source code on my laptop and use a volume mount to get that source code visible inside the container so that I can use my editor outside of the container and test inside. So that will launch it for you. And once we're inside the container, we can go into the folder where we put the code. Python setup.py build will compile the extension. And if you want, you can run the tests like this as well. So it'll run the full test suite. <clears throat> if you want to run PyTango scripts, or if you want to use PyTest directly, or run a Python session and import Tango, then you have to install the package. So then you go to the folder where the source is, put install, dash E is nice if you're going to be editing the files and you want to have those changes um, in the installed version immediately. So I typically do it that way. And then if you're using an IDE, uh, which I like doing, there's some instructions in the readme about how to set that up. With PyCharm, um, if you're working with a Docker container, you need the professional version to connect to Docker containers. If you have Visual Studio Code, you can get the remote containers extension for free. All right, then we can do an example. So I'll run this code for you just now, just to show you it's in the, the presentation. And uh, yeah, I'll talk about this as I demonstrate it for you. So let's go to the terminal. Right, so here I'm gonna do the Docker run commands. I've already built the container. And you can see I've mounted it into the opt slash PyTango folder. 
question is the, the code, if it was the first time I built the container, then I would have to do set up the pi build and pip install it. Uh, I've already done the build, so it should go quickly. Uh, pip install. All right, so what I wanted to show is an example of the, the clock device server. So in this folder, there's a clock DS. You can have a look at that code quickly. So this is just a simple Tango device with clock. And it's got a few attributes and commands. So I want to run that. And it's convenient to use the uh, device test context to run these things without a Tango database. It just makes the setup much simpler. So if I do tango.test context, sorry, dash M, and then I use the name of the Python file, just clock DS, and a dot, and then the name of the device, which is clock and we should get it running. Um, what you might see here in the slide is if you see ready to accept request twice, and people often ask what does that mean? And it means that the CPP Tango uh, code was compiled in debug mode. So it's a magic feature. And it gives you the URLs for the device access and also if you want the admin device. You can see dbase is no because we're just using the test context. There's no Tango database in this case. So I can copy that. If I want to connect to this, I need a, a device proxy that's in the same container. So I'm going to run another shell connecting to the same container and I'll just run Python so I can import Tango and make a device proxy. Device proxy, paste that URL. So we should be able to ping it and to be able to see what attributes it has. Right, so we can create the time or medium time. So now we, this is a very easy way to, to test a simple device. You can run it without the database and you can connect to it and exercise the commands and the attributes. Let's back to the presentation. Here we have um, just that code from the client side. All right, what about running the test? So the test implemented with PyTest. So you can run the full test suite by executing PyTest. Uh, click this one, click that. So if I go back to the root, Run PyTest. We have put installed already. So you can see it's, it's found a thousand tests to execute. So you can wait for that to run. Um, or if you want to just run a single test, you can use dash K to filter. So you could take a name of a test like that. And we just run single test or you know, maybe a partial match. Lots of features you can do with PyTango, sorry, with PyTest. You can add the PDB option. So if your test is failing, you add the dash dash PDB, then it will drop you into a debugger at the point of the assertion error. So there's just some standard PyTest things you can do. Uh, I like to run the tests from the, the IDE on PyCharm. 
Um, and what we'll see now is that it doesn't work out the box. Um, you have to modify setup CFG. In the setup CFG file, the section of the PyTest and basically tells PyTest to run all of the tests in the tests folder. So uh, it doesn't actually work with PyCharm if you try and run a single test and you have this option specified. And the next point is this dash dash boxed option. It can also be dash dash forked. And that means to run each, uh, each test in a new process. The device test context, which launches the, the Tango device, it crashes if you try and use it twice in the same process. It has to do with the, the cleanup of the singletons. So to get around that, we run each test in a separate process. And we found when we started running the unit tests on Windows that this option doesn't exist. Windows doesn't actually support forking processes in this way. And uh, we ended up running each test with a single call to buy test. So let's just show you some of these things in the IDE. All right, so here I'm in test server and here's a, a single test. If I try and run it, should fail and it gives me an error about you know, found zero items. So if we edit the setup CFG file, take out this test option and now we try and run it again and we should be able to, to execute our test. And so that makes it a lot easier to Debug. Right, next point is so now you want to contribute something, so uh, you need to write a test for it. The first thing to do is decide which file should the test go in. Um, so in the test folder, we've got conf test, which is where all the PyTest fixtures are imported from. If you want to add a new fixture, it might go in there. Um, then we've got various files for testing. So this async one tests specifically command in out async. The test client uh, does the device proxy tests. And these is the launch instance of the Tango test device. So you've got to have that available. And you can install that from Conda as well. And then it will, you know, use device proxies to communicate with that Tango test device and exercise all the functionality that we need. The test event looks at event subscription, test server, test the device, and then we've got tests for the test context itself. So you'll see you tune, you'll have a, a test underscore and then some name. So if you're test that you want to add doesn't fit into one of these files and you can make a new one. Otherwise, try and put it in the right place. All right, so once you've picked a file, hopefully there's an existing one, then often you'll be able to find a similar test and just copy the pattern. Uh, so, you know, have a look through the file first before you just add something at the end, try and group relate things together. And another thing you'll notice is that we use PyTest fixtures to cover many variants of the test case. So for example, this one that test reading and writing attributes takes in type values fixture and a server green mode. And if you look at the test run output, you'll see it calls it 24 times, three times for integer, once for each type of green mode, except features, then floats and strings. And in each of these types of values, for each integer, there's a loop here where it's going through a whole lot of different test values. So that makes it very easy to, to get quite good coverage of the tests. That's my suggestion. 
you also see that we, we very often will define a, a test device in place. Um, it just makes it easier to read. So you inherit from device and you, if there's something very specific that you want that device to do, you can just define it there. There are cases where you just need some generic test device and you just reuse it on all the tests and that's fine as well. All right, now we're gonna to move to architecture overview. Um, so Jeff is gonna present a couple of slides and really show you what happens between these, these layers. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Anton. Is that uh, viewable by everybody? Looks good. Okay. I'm going to show you effectively what happens in the in the binding from when you call your device proxy and how it gets down into the CPP Tango layer. Oops. How do I get rid of that? Okay. Device proxy. It's the device proxy state that I will be discussing where we, we look at the state of the of, uh, Tango device server. So in the init method, under bar init method of uh, PyTango, we define the green mode, which uh, Anton has uh, already explained. And this uh, is the call argument from Tango. So we see that it's it's a device proxy method, and we're calling state, uh, and returns the self state, and the arguments aren't used in this uh, particular instance. So this is like a general pattern for the um, a lot of Python calls into uh, the binding layer. So most of the um, this section here is the boost Python <coughs> uh, definition. And it's an uh, exported the device proxy. And boost Python declarations all start with this dot def and it's followed by the the name of the uh, method that we want to call and this in the initial implementation is a, a a pointer to a static function called state passing in the argument itself and on this side this is the the, the actual call to the C++ Tango layer, we guard against um, the allowing Python threads in, and we return. That's the the return self state is the actual call to the C++ layer. So you can see the the follow through from a user calling device proxy dot state. It goes through the py the Python layer into this definition, and that then is calls this static method here, dev state. So that's that is um, how it is at, at the moment, and I've been working on some code. Uh, next one. How can I get the next one? Push left or right on your. Yeah, that, uh, that's it. <clears throat> so effectively, the device proxy state definition is the same. All of this method is the same. That's what we've been trying to do to keep the Python layer the same so that it doesn't impact upon or too much upon um, uh, 
um, code that's already in existence. So the, the changes are effectively in the pi, pi bind 11 binding area. So effectively, we have the same export device proxy. Uh, we have the same dot def, which is a, a standard, same name. But here we're using uh, the C++11 um, Lambda function to call the, the, um, the same self.state, which is the Tango C++ signature. And we, we're using the, um, the return, we get a return code of um, a Tango dev state. So effectively, this, this type of binding, it's, it's a lot of boilerplate code. And most of the um, PyTango methods have been implemented in, in this way, where there's small amounts of um, interface. Some of the larger methods do rely on the static function still, but this is still work in progress. And it will probably be the topic of a, another webinar in the future, probably when I get time to prepare one. Okay, thank you, Anton. Okay. Oops, that one. Sorry. All right, so now we're going to go through a practical example of the code navigation. What happens when an attribute is read? So we're going to look at what happens on the client side in the device proxy, what happens on the server side in the device, and we put a simple little test device I'll show you in the code now. Okay, I've got a lot of breakpoints. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, like this, we've got, um, I just implemented this with a, a PyTest, easy. Uh, so the test device has a single attribute called voltage, which is a float, it's read, write, and we just either return that value or in the write method, we modify the value. It's a really trivial device. We can launch it using the device test context, which will give us a device proxy that is connected to that device. And the first thing we're going to do is using the low-level API. So if we call read attribute and we give the name of the attribute voltage, that, that would be the low-level way of, of reading it. Um, then we can look at the value. We can look at the, the quality of that return value. Um, in the high-level case, we would just access an attribute with the name of the Tango attribute directly. All right, so that's a lot simpler. So we'll see what happens in this case. And I've also got a couple of examples of writing. So let's run this. Um, take this option away as well. Just run a single test. Oh, okay. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right. Let's see what happens. So if we just run through this. So when it does read attribute, if we, we expect it to call the read method voltage. Um, if we do the high level read, Proxy to voltage, same thing. We expect it to end up here in the read method. And if 
we do a right attribute, ends up in the right method, signs a new value. We're going to read back to check. So that gives us another call into read. And then a high level assignment. We'll put us in the right method and reading back. We'll go read once more. Right, so that's what the test is doing. We'll go into more detail now. Right, so if you step into this code, first thing you see is that we're going to green.py and then we're in a basically a function decorator. And the function that we are wrapping is device proxy read attribute that similar to what Jeff was showing you earlier. So because the device proxy can have the green mode set, it's pretty much every function you call on a device proxy has to check what green mode should we be using. And you can also tell it whether you want to wait on the call or not. You can give it a timeout, all of those things are handled. And then it has to get an executor. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail of that, but you can see that we got back a synchronous executor because that's the default behavior. If you had asked for um, features or G event or something, then you would get a different executor. Then it uses that executor to run the function, which is the read attribute function. So now we're in the executor run method. It's going to jump over a few things. It's going to call the function here. And we can step into that. And now you'll see we're in device proxy.py. And you can see all these methods that have this dunder device proxy name. And this one is read attribute. And we're going to call underscore read attribute in there. Similar to how we saw underscore state in the slide Jeff was showing. So if we go, if we step into that code, now I've jumped into the server.py. And this is because um, obviously we want to now do a call on the server side. We are running the, the Tango device and the client in the same process. And it wants to do the always executed hook. So you know that every time an attribute or command is accessed, there's an always executed hook call. And it also has to figure out which, use, which worker to use. So based on the server side green mode, um, how must it execute this command? So be a few steps here. Right there, it ends up calling the function. We are not doing asynchronous mode, so we can just call it directly. Um, so go through it twice. Now we end up in a, a dummy implementation of the voice executed hook. So you'll see this is in the base device class. Go up a little. So when you inherit from device, um, device inherits from base device, which inherits from the latest implementation. And it's got an empty implementation of the voice executed hook. Obviously, you can override that in your implementation if you want. Then we execute it. Now we're back in the client, read attribute again. Um, and you'll see we've now jumped back to the server. So we still haven't finished the client read. Now the server wants to do read at your hardware. Right, so that gets called once per uh, either read attribute call or if you do read attributes, you also do read attribute hardware once. And it needs to get the executor, um, call the function, just step a few times here. And now we're in read attribute hardware, which is also in the base device. And obviously you could override that. 
Are we almost there? <laughs> now, let's go one more time. All right, so we've done voice executed hook, we've done read attribute hardware. Now we are doing read attribute on the server side. And again, it's also wrapped in a green mode, so it needs need to get a worker to execute the method. Um, so our worker is a synchronous executor. And we'll see the read method should finally get back to our test code. All right, so now we're in our test device. We're in this voltage read method. And there were a lot of, of steps to get you. But we can finally return our voltage. And and it has a function called set complex value. So let's just have a look what that does. And we're passing in an W attribute object. And the value we got back from the user's code was float. And this is handling some special cases. So the one case is for a dev encoded type. It has to um, extract the data in a certain way. The other case is if you return a tuple. So with the high level API, I found out recently that you can either return just a simple value that you want, or you can return a tuple of three items, which is the value, the time, and the attribute quality. So if you choose to return the tuple, then it will go into this part of the code and it will you set value date quality, which means you can return the, the time and quality as well as the value. In our example, we are not returning a tuple, we just return 0, 0.0. So we go into this simpler case. Okay, so a lot of steps. Um, I think we finished the read attribute. Now we're gonna go into check read attribute. So this dev adder, this is basically what we've received back from the server as a Python object now. And there's this check for if there was a failure or not, in which case we raise an exception. And finally, we can return the value. We're going back to the client screen mode. And finally, we got our low level API reading back as an attribute. Right, so we can see all the details here. It's a scalar, didn't fail. The name is voltage. You can see the time it happened. Value zero and the quality is here. Right. So let's keep stepping over. The next case is the high level API read. So that we expect most of the same thing to happen, but there must be something extra that happens for a high level API read. So we're just accessing proxy.voltage. Step into that code. You see you in a method called get adder. And the reason we're here is because the device proxy doesn't have an attribute called voltage. And so it uses Python to magically pretend that it has an attribute of that name. Interesting that you can't use names that start with an underscore for attributes. And the first thing we have to figure out now, we the device proxy doesn't have a voltage attribute. You think that the server has a voltage attribute. Um, but the device proxy is going to check, is it, is it a command that has that name? Is it a tribute that has that name? Or is it a pipe that has that name? So the device proxy keeps a, a cache of the commands, attributes, and pipes that it knows about. And that's hidden away inside the device proxy's dictionary. There's a command cache. So if we have a look there, um, you'll see it knows about the init command, the state and the status commands. And we didn't have any other commands. 
and we are looking for voltage. Right, so voltage doesn't exist in that command cache. It's not a command in our server. Uh, next thing we try is attributes. Is it an attribute? So let's see. Right, if we look at the list of attributes that we know about on the server, we know about voltage, state, and status. So yeah, we've got a hit now. Uh, add to info exists. And now we can call a method called get attribute value. Um, if it wasn't in the attribute cache, then it would look in the pipe cache. And if it didn't find it in any of those three, then it's going to try and refresh the caches. So maybe the uh, interface of the device has changed and the device proxy didn't update itself yet. So we can do refresh command cache. Uh, if we have a look at that method, you will see it does something like commandless query. Similarly, we can refresh the attribute cache with attribute this query. So there's a lot of things happening when you use a high level API. First checks, um, does it know about this thing already? If not, we'll refresh command cache and try that and then we'll refresh attribute cache and then pipe cache. And finally, if you couldn't find it anywhere, then it will see, um, yeah, can I call set adger? This is going to make a new attribute. So you might even be able to use attributes that don't exist and then you end up creating them. All right, so that's all those steps. Uh, now we're going to look at the read attribute. So we found it in the attribute cache and we're calling this get attribute value function. So You'll see finally it does the low level read attribute call and then extracts the value from that call. So if we were to step through this again, we will see the same things where we find the, the executor. We're going to call the function on the client side, it's going to end up on the server side. All of that's going to happen. Um, let's just go back up. Oh, sorry. Uh, return value. Again, we are going to check if there was a failure. And all right, so now we have done the low level read and we can extract just the value. So with the high level API, you can't read the time or the quality of the attribute. You can only access the value. But that's generally what you want. There's a special case here for enumeration. So if you have a, a def enum type attribute, then it's more convenient if it comes back to you as a instance of an enumeration rather than just the integer value. Otherwise you have to go and associate the integer value with the labels and it's a lot harder to, to work with. So if we're working with enumeration specifically, we'll instantiate an instance of that enumeration class using the integer value that we received. Okay, so that is a high level API read. Hope you're still following. It's, <laughs> it's quite a deep stack to go down. Uh, we can look at read to write attribute as well for interest. Uh, look a bit quicker. So low level write attribute. In this case, can we need the Go through the green mode on the client side. Oh, going a bit deeper than last time. Right. OK. 
synchronous. I don't want to go into all the details there. Um, again, we're going to run the command that we call an underscore attribute. And just to show you um, where it's going to go before we step there. So, so we're calling right attribute, right attribute is wrapped in the green function. And the one we're looking for is underscore right attribute. Right, so it doesn't actually exist in the, the Python code in device proxy.py. If we want to find its definition, we have to go to the C code. So here you will see these dot defs that Jeff was showing you. So basically we're making a Python object and we're saying it has a method called write attribute or underscore write attribute. And that when you call it, it will call this C++ code in the extension. You'll see it actually occurs twice here and that's because we have two different C++ signatures. In the one case, you just give it uh, a string and an object. In the other case, you give it an attribute info object instead of just a string. So there are different low level functions. Uh, right, so if we look at this one, Okay. All right, so you saw a bit of this code in Jeff's slide. So this is still in the C code of device proxy. And you know, the boost.def call pointed to this right attribute function or actually the string version, this one. So what you can see here is a call to write attribute and self is an instance of, or pointed to, actually that's a reference to Tango device proxy. This is a C++ object. And we can have a look quickly at the C++ code. So, this is a checkout of um, the CPP Tango code. So in Dev API base, there's a device proxy right attribute method. So the Python code is now, or well, the extension code is going to call this method, which is going to actually interact with our server and do the Cobra call to right attribute. Right. And then you also see there's a scope defined here and inside there's this guard, which says auto Python allow threads. So the reason this is here is because we want to release the GIL, um, Python's global interpreter lock before we make this call. This call is gonna do some remote IO, it can take a while for that to happen. And we don't wanna block um, our Python process until that's finished. So this guard, I'll uh, show you implementation. It says you should run any IO intensive operations like replacing data through the network in the context of one of these. So you'll see it's a uh, constructor calls pi eval save thread. So that's from the C Python API. And that means I'm releasing the gill now. And then when you destroy it, calls restore thread, which means I need the gill again. So we block until we can reacquire the gill and carry on executing. Right, so you'll see a lot of these auto Python allow threads. All right, so that's what's happening when we 
call this right attribute. It's going into the boost layer, executing the C++ code, releasing the gil, calling CPP Tango's right attribute. When the value comes back, it has to reacquire the gil and then it can return up here. All right, again, in the server side code with a voice executed hook, go through that one. Uh, then the next one is, okay, right attribute. So now we've did voice executed hook. Now we're gonna do right attribute. So the first thing is to get the right value now it's 24 and then using the right worker which will be a synchronous worker it's going to call this right method and it's passing in that value of 24. All right, so now it's finished with the right attribute Okay, so that was a low level right attribute call. Um, we can reach back again. Let's skip over that, so it's reading. And then the last one is using the high level API to write the voltage. So if we step into that, we're now in a set actor call, again, because the device proxy doesn't have a method it doesn't have an attribute called voltage. So again, it needs to check, is this a command I'm supposed to execute? Is it an attribute I'm supposed to write to? So it checks if it's in the cache. It checks if it's in the attribute cache. It is, and so now it's gonna call set attribute value. Um, similarly, it would refresh if it didn't find it on the first pass. Okay, so set attribute value. And here's another special case for dev enum attributes. Uh, there's a feature added which allows you to assign a string to an enum attribute instead of you know, the right integer value, which is very convenient. So if we detect that this attribute is a div enum and you passed in a, a string or you tried to assign a string to the div enum, then we will use the enum class to look up what is the correct integer value to send. So this makes it very convenient to use enums. In our case, we don't have an enum class just the floats. Now we're going to call right attribute, which is that low level right that we went through the previous time. Uh, okay, that's the right head. Now we finished setting the attribute, and then we can read back again. And that's the end of demonstration. Very took so long to get set up. All right, just the last few slides and then we'll get into questions. Uh, some tips. So compiling the extension basically means we take all the C++ files in the DXT folder and we create an underscore Tango shared library. If you look in the PyTango code, you'll see imports from underscore Tango. And depending on your environment, the actual file name will be something like this. So the next Python 3.8, that would be the name. And this happens when you run Python setup build or pip installed for the first time. Um, on Linux, we, we don't have the binary, a binary wheel for, for PyTango. So you'll have the source code. Obviously if you're developing, you're, you're working from the source code. 
Um, sometimes when you're doing this build step, you will get a, a compilation error. Either it's missing an include, it can't find some source files that it needs, or sometimes at the linking stage, it can't find a library to link against. And there's a number of environment variables that you can set before you do the build step or compilation that can basically point it to the right installation folders. So where's Tango, where's OmniOrb, where's Zero MQ, where's Boost. And in our CI, which works under Conda, we set all of those variables to the Conda prefix, which will be the, the Conda installation location of the current environment. Um, with Boost, there's some additional uh, environment variables so you can, can change you know, more things. Boost seems to have changed a lot over the years with the naming of their packages and different on different distributions of Linux. So there's more knobs that you can, can tweak. If you go and look and set up the Pi on this link, you'll find some more details about how to use these environment variables. <clears throat> all right, another one. Uh, so if you have all the XT files and they haven't changed, but maybe their timestamps have changed. Maybe you edited it and did the change or you switched branches in Git or something, then it will end up wanting to do the full compilation again, which will take you another five minutes. So if you know that the files there match the ESO file, the Tango shared library that you already have, then you can just use touch to change the timestamp on that file, and then it will skip the compilation. So as long as this file is newer than the extension files, then Python won't, won't do a compilation. And we do this in CI as well, where we, we cache the previous version, and then we check if there's been no changes, and if there's no changes, we do this touch trick. There is also a make file. Um, I'm not sure if it's used or up to date. I I've tried it once, but haven't been that successful. I think Jeff is using it for the pipeline 11 work and he's made some modifications. That's obviously a, would be a nicer way to, to do this. Um, if you don't want to fix the make file and let's say you're working not in the Python code, but you're making a change in some of the C++ layer, then you probably don't want to have to wait for the full five minute compilation every time you make a change. So what you can do is just compile that single file that you've changed and link it again. And the command you need to run is very long, but you can see from a previous run of Python sort of pipe build, it tells you what's the compiler it's using, so you need all of this information. Then it says there's additional options. So you need all these options. Uh, there's a dash C. After the dash C, you give the name of the CPP file that you want to compile. Uh, there's some extra options to add. And then you need a dash O, which will tell it where you want the object file. And you must just put it in the same folder that would normally end up in. Um, so that'll be a very quick compilation. And then you just run the linking step again. So this is sort of the manual approach. Alternatively, get the make file working and it would be easier. If you want to report a crash, so if your Tango device or our client is sick vaulted, then it's useful for us to see a stack trace. So either you can do this in your own environment um, or in a Docker image. I, it's better if you do it in a Docker image because then we can test in exactly the same environment that you have, but maybe it doesn't crash in the Docker image, it only crashes in your unusual environment. But if you're doing it in a Docker, uh, you can run just as a plain mini conda environment. And then from Conda, we can install PyTango and C++ Tango 
debug symbols. So you would make use kind of create, make a new environment, then kind of activate, and then the install step would use the channel kind of forge. And there's a pre-compiled binary of PyTango there, is from 933. And uh, Benjamin added CPP Tango debug symbols as a separate package. So if you don't put this one here, CPP Tango will be installed as a dependency for PyTango. But if you want to have more details about the CPP Tango call stack, then having this additional package will give us the, the line numbers. Uh, if you don't have GDB installed, which you won't in Minicondo, then you can install it as well. And finally, you would run and you would run your script through GDB with a command like this. Start it running, and when it crashes, we should see an output telling us where the problem occurred. And if you run BT, it'll print out the full backtrace. So that kind of information is really useful when you want to report this because then the other kind of developers can see exactly where the problem occurred. All right, I think this is the second last slide. How does contribution work? Um, so we have contributors and maintainers. And it's good to discuss new ideas or issues um, in GitLab issues. Maybe before you start implementing something, we might want to talk about, do we want this new feature? Uh, what's a good way to implement it? So a lot of the time we'll start with a, a GitLab issue and there'll be some discussion around the community. Um, so you can do that. If you're just fixing an issue, um, you want to make a merge request, so you would typically fork the, the repository. Uh, the main branch is called develop. I put a little star here because we are thinking of renaming it main, which is the convention followed in CPP Tango now. So you yep, fork your repo, make the changes, uh, make your tests, make sure they pass. You can create a merge request. And then there'll be some review cycles. So your changes can be committed to the merge request. CI will run um, Windows. CI will be an app layer. Linux, Conda CI in GitLab. And it will tell you if all the tests are still passing. We do have a couple of flaky tests, um, especially on the Windows side, where we will just rerun nothing to do with events. And you're running the test will typically pass the second time. Um, the maintainers or other reviewers will can then look at those changes and comment, and maybe you make some more. So the usual merge request review cycle. Once everyone's happy, then that gets merged to the main branch. Uh, yeah, thanks to Solana developers for the idea for this diagram. All right, there's more information on our read the docs page. So go have a look there. Okay, it was a long talk. Um, now we can get into some questions. Now, Reynolds, do you want to uh, Try that part, or should I? Well, if you if you can open the the chat, I think you. Let's go back. To you, the you, you will see the question. Do you? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Andy says, "Batango." It was a Batango version based on OmniPy. Okay, Batango went into production. And so Leo decided to wrap C instead. Okay. Corne Lucan, what is the default communication library used in PyTango Omni or Pro Zero MQ? Or are they both used together? 
yeah, they're both used. They do different things. Um, C++ Tango is using those libraries. So attribute reads and writes commands, that is, is Corba communication. Zero MQ is for the events. So if you're subscribing to events, the subscription is done using Corba, but um, once you subscribe, the events mechanism is it's traveling over zero in queue. And I think Omni Orb also is involved in packing and unpacking the data that is sent by zero in queue. You okay with that, Corne? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What, what was the question again? Sorry. So you asked the question in the chat about the default yeah, communication oh yeah, library, that's and I, are you yeah, happy sure. with the answer? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, works. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the, then the Python database server. Can anyone comment on the, the status of the Python implementation of database DS? Anyone from Elba here? CSRF use it? Um, Bliss? Well, at least not in my group. <laughs> okay. So I think Elba had some work on that. Sergi had a version. I think they on the call. Um, Corn is happy to help Docker builds and Benjamin has also done work on that. So yeah, you're welcome, both of you, to contribute something there. Another suggestion. Igor, you ask why don't we have a pure Python implementation? What was the decision behind the C++ binding? Um, yeah, Andy, you <laughs> said that Salel decided to not to go that route. I don't know if you can remember why they decided that. Uh, this was very, very early days. I don't know if Stefan Poirier is here. I don't know if he wasn't involved with that. Were you involved with that? Remember, it was even uh, when Lure was, you were still sitting in Lure many years ago. Anyway, it was a very, it was like a proof of concept using the PY Omniorb binding yeah? um, implementation, which was pure Python. But then uh, there wasn't any manpower to continue with the, um, I, I mean, implementing all of the features because the C++ was growing very fast. Yeah? And it would still be a situation maybe today is to find someone, people who could implement everything in pure Python so that you don't, you know, you, you have to then any new feature has to be implemented again. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it was, it was, a huge, it was, yeah, a huge it was task. A kind of, it was a, a compromise. Yeah, there's so much functionality the CPP Tango gives us that we don't have to be implement. Um, now, Igor, you've got a, a Java implementation of of Tango. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, but we it, see the problem it sometimes good. that it's yeah. that it's lagging. Yeah. Yeah. Igor, do you want to comment? Um. Um, but I mean, um, a pure Python implementation would like make all the PyBind 11 work not necessary. So, I mean, of course, I mean, having it, writing it would be a lot of work, but you would also have a couple of problems less. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's definitely advantages uh, as well. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a, but. Uh, uh, I don't know, probably to be a good year of work yeah, or something. Yeah. Yep, it's a big jump. Yeah. 
Um, right. Andy, you asked about threading in PyTango. Um, yeah, no, but you did you you did cover it. I just wanted to let people realize where the gill is released, and then you know where. Hmm. Yeah. So if if you subscribe to events as well, then you will get a callback function that you want to be called. And obviously, before that callback is executed in the Python code, we'd have to grab the gill. Hmm. So anytime we're switching from you know, CPP Tango threads to Python, we have to to get the gill again. Okay. Uh, Anton, yeah, there's yes. one thing that you might like to mention it is in the Python code, you should there's a you have to use a with ensure it's the Omni Orb thread that you're using. Yeah, so there's an ensure Omni thread context handler. That's it. Yeah, which yeah, if you're writing Python threads, you're using the Python threading library, and in that Python thread you're going to be interacting. With Tango, then it's good practice to to wrap that thread with this context handler. Um, it basically gives a Python thread an Omni Orb ID, which means that C Tango can then be aware of, of that work because it uses the thread IDs to um, handle locking. So if it doesn't know that this particular thread is a yeah, an omni thread, then it might not do the locking correctly. So we had some rare cases where that ends up with a deadlock. Then there was some improvement in CPP Tango, and now it's debatable <laughs> if that particular bug is still there, or if we always need to use this in show omni -op. Uh, The corner you asked about is the limitation of only able to spawn a single device instance only applicable to Pytango unit tests? Or is this a limitation when the library is used externally? I yeah, because you had to spawn individual unit tests in each one in a separate process, right? Yeah, you can run multiple devices in a single process. That's fine. Um, even in the unit tests, we, we run multiple devices in the same process, the same test. Mm -hmm. The, the problem occurs when you try to start a new device server. Okay. When I start two, two device servers in the same process, then it doesn't work because the first time you start a device server, some singleton objects are created. Um, the util class in particular. It is. Is yep. this something that we would want to move away from in the future so that perhaps we could have a unit test or run in the same process or have integration tests that utilize multiple device servers at once? Or is this not necessarily something we want? I think it would be beneficial. It slows your tests down to run them in processes. But maybe someone from the CPP can comment on that. So it's the util instance singleton that there's no way of cleaning it up. Oh, okay. So it lives in C++, it doesn't live in Python. Yes. Okay, clear. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't clear yeah. to me. At this but, it would, would, but it would be nice to, yeah, to make a small change in CPP Tango. You know, Thomas, Reynold, Michal, I know you can... Well, uh, I would say that uh, it was not for design like that at the beginning. So, yeah, mm -hmm. if, you, if you would like to support this, yeah, some changes are, are required for sure. Okay. Yeah, we have a workaround for now. Okay, clear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think I've covered Andy's comment about threading. Um, Samuel says, question, how is it that you're using the breakpoint without getting error from three-second timeout? I always run into that issue. 
using the debugger. Hmm, that is interesting. Um, probably because it's all in the same process. So if I was just debugging a client and my server was remote, then I might get it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's because uh, it, since you you're in the same process, you you're just invoking the the methods directly, so you're not. Um, uh, and if it would be on, on a different process, yeah, for sure you would get a timeout. But there are some uh, work around. There are some ways to um, some options to GDB that you can use to to ignore uh, the sick pipe, I, I think, and to avoid this this issue that uh, you with a three second uh, timeout that would just uh, make the debugging session difficult. Um, so, I, okay, I as you can also, you could change the, the timeout to be very, very long, just for that test, if you were getting that problem. Okay, uh, will the slides be available? Uh, yeah, I can make a clear PDF of the slides you now once we upload the recording, or maybe even before that, we'll, we'll put it on. I think it'll to be a news item in terms of controls. And we have all the links open. If you're not previously, I think you modified the news items to just have links. Yes, it will be available. Um, Andy says, yes, so F uses the green mode a lot for beamline controls. Um, do you mean async IO green mode, Andy, or which one specifically? Andy, are you still there? I'll answer that, Anton. They use okay. GFN yeah. a lot. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I was just uh, in another meeting at, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We use Gvents. Uh, we depend on Gvents. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know because yeah. I thought I caught something that Reynolds was saying he wasn't sure we use it, but we do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Reynolds hey. asks is the, is the right edger hardware method called? Um, yes, it is called. We didn't see it. Um, I'm not sure why. I... Maybe I didn't look uh, careful, carefully enough. Huh? <laughs> it could be. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was. Um, so I have another I have another example where I've put sort of all the methods that you can have. So in a device, in it, read it hardware, write it hardware. Um, it gets called after writing. A tribute. So, let's see if we can get a breakpoint there. Oh, another thing you might notice if you debug this way is if you don't have a breakpoint before launching the device context, it doesn't work so nicely. If I just had a breakpoint here and ran it, then you'll see that the debugger doesn't report back on. Details of these objects. I don't know why that is either. Uh, so let's quickly try this one. Fingers crossed. So we want to do contribute right. Okay, so if we call, and we can also do have always executed. Right, so first it goes into always executed. Um, then it goes into the write method, the user's attribute write method. And after it's finished with that, it will call write at your hardware. Mm -hmm. Very easy. <laughs> and then, yeah, then it's finished. So it does, have, I'm not sure why you didn't see it in the debug session, maybe because it's was probably too too fast, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see. 
There is a GDP command to avoid the timeout. Okay, so handle sit pipe. And says, can you switch out of executors in PyTango, for instance, switch from green, let's synchronous to OS managed threads. Um, you can change the green mode almost at any time. You can change the global green mode, which would be really would be dangerous, but you can you can switch it. Are, there, are you asking if there's a specific implementation? I was managed threads. Well, you use the synchronous executor, right, in green mode, mm -hmm. which means that yes. everything is running in the same software thread, essentially, and the threads are yes. user user managed. So I'm mm -hmm. asking, is there a mode of execution that you actively support, I would say, that switches to OS managed threads? Or is this just something that's not implemented or not supported? Because like uh, you can switch these so, modes, I believe. Yeah, so um, if you want a different type of executor, so there's this abstract class and then we've various implementations. So there's a synchronous one, which we saw. Um, there's the G event executor. And so that's using G event thread pool. Okay. Which underneath must be using an OS thread of some kind. Yes. Um, then there is the futures one. The futures executor. Where does it delegate to it uses a process pool or a thread pool execution? Okay, so you can choose Q's. both. Uh, yeah. And then you, of course, also get futures, which are quite nice. Uh, and then there's the async IO executor. Okay, okay. There's a quite quite a happy, happy variety, I would say. Yeah. Cool. And cool. It's, this event loop's going to have its own thread. Basically. Okay. Um, one of the things to be careful with if you are using these other green modes is that the um, device synchronization, the serialization model is changed, it's turned off. So that you know, if you're halfway through a command, you, your device can accept another command. Okay. So, so this requires some uh, additional uh, things to be aware of while uh, creating your devices. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Even with the synchronous mode, you can you, know, you can change the synchronization model for the device. You can turn it off if you want to, um, but it, yeah, it gets turned off automatically with the async IO one. All right, we're just over our time limit. Um, I don't see any other questions. Thanks everyone for attending. I hope that some of you will contribute now, feel more comfortable with PyTango, um, or at least understand what it's doing. And we will yeah, make all this available for those who couldn't attend or want to refer back to it later. <laughs>